So does that mean it's now officially, uh, what is it, Tuesday for you now? You've caught yeah, up on us? I've caught up with you. It's Tuesday here as well. Always that little bit behind. That's all right. We won't hold it against you. <laughs> We're used to it. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Terrific. G'day, everyone, and welcome to what we're going to call unofficially Whiskey Masterclass with uh, Westwood's Mullen Munro episode three uh, here tonight on the Oak Barrel live stream. My name is Scott Fitzsimons. It is 6 p.m. in Tuesday in Australia. It is midnight or midnight plus one in uh, Portland, Oregon, in America on Tuesday. And I have with me a very, very special guest once again. Uh, feels like a frequent visitor to the Oak Barrel now, even though he only has been here physically once. Uh, Miles Munro from the Westwood Distillery. Miles, how are you? Great, great, Scott. How are you? Bloody excellent, mate. Bloody good. Now, um, thank you once again for staying up nice and late for us. Um, well, sure. The whiskey helps. Yeah, that's, that's what it's for. Um, a good day to the couple of people in the Zoom chat, but uh, everyone tuning in onto the Facebook and YouTube, that, uh, that weird place that is the YouTube comment section. I, I promise I will look a little bit there, but if, if I don't, I'm scared um, and I'll just focus on here. But um, g'day to, uh, to Whiskey in Isolation as well. Now, um, what's happened since the last time we spoke? It was it a couple of months, I think, since we've had a bit of a chat like this? Yeah, yeah, it has been a few months, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, um, I guess you've managed to get your hands on a, a few cases of some uh, Pinot Noir finish right here, what we'll be tasting tonight. 100%. Yeah, I think, only, I think only 10 cases to Australia. Sort of yeah, that. and I got five of them, so well done. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you got that check in the mail, uh, and I'm glad that, that Margot got that uh, free Oak Barrel t-shirt that got all this across the line, so. Um, that's what we were after. No, that's quite good. Um, and a quick day to um, Alexandra Dahlenberg, friend of the stream, friend of the distillery, tuning in on the Facebook there. Uh, might be a familiar name uh, to some people. But, I mean, apart from what we're going to talk about tonight, what, like what, what's been happening? Has it been business as usual? Do you guys have any off periods throughout the year when you're distilling? Or what's what's the last couple of months looked like in the in uh, Yeah, Westwood? yeah, sure. It's, it's um, uh, hey to Alex as well. Um, this has been, yeah, you know, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, I think, for everyone. But, yeah, you know, here at our facility, um, we we weren't really sure – what was going to happen with grain supply? We weren't sure really what was going to happen with grain pickup, you know, farmers heading into the metro area of Portland. Um, so, yeah, we, we dialed way back on, uh, on whiskey production for, for a good portion of our, our downtime here, probably, you know, four or five months or so. We've really kind of dialed back. Um, and, yeah, you know, we've got, uh, we've got a full whiskey warehouse um, we've got plenty of stock aging, but yeah, really, really dialed back on what we were making. Um, you know, we wanted to be really careful. Also, this is a production facility. We wanted to make sure people were properly distanced from each other. So yeah, we did. We took a break there over the summer. Um, and actually, we uh, uh, followed suit after Australia from earlier this year. And we had massive wildfires here along the west coast of the U.S. also that were, were basically 0% contained for weeks. And um, one of the biggest fires in Oregon actually got within, um, oh, about 10, 12 miles or so of, uh, of my barrel house. They were actually evacuating the next city over. And um, so yeah, every single barrel of Westward that I have that I was watching over was very, very close to getting burned up in one of those wildfires. So it's been, it's been a wild time for sure. Yeah, well, look, we we heard we heard quite a little bit about it over here, but it's been one of those things. Obviously, you know, you, you referenced the fires that we had, and um, it seems like a previous life. Um, and it's just like, okay, you know, California's burnt to the ground. 
yep, 2020. Yeah, I just expected that. You know, that's yeah, it's just one of those years. But that's um, we obviously had some close calls with Australian distilleries here um, through that January and, and February period. Um, but yeah, luckily that fingers crossed, um, everything stays safe over there for for you guys. But it is um, fire and whiskey barrels don't necessarily mix, so we'll try and keep them away as much as yeah. possible. Yeah, they don't play well together. Actually, we've got. Um, just, just a little ways down from the barrel house is a, is a battalion headquarters, a, a, a fire and rescue station. And I, I made sure to go over and tell them that if they saw the building on fire to actually run away, to not go near it because it, it was gonna explode. So <laughs> fair warning. But yeah, you know, 2020, you never want to assume that the worst is over, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's the glamor of distilling that you love, I think. Um, just just all, those, all those bits that people don't always see. Um, but yeah, let, look, let, let's let, let's talk about some some more promising things. And um, and yes, we we mentioned just before that we have uh, we were very lucky here at the Oak Barrel to receive a uh, what was small but by comparison quite a healthy allocation of the Westwood Pinot Noir cast. Now we've seen a Pinot Noir cast come to Australia um, for one of the whiskey subscription services previously, but this is uh, a little bit of a, a different release. And we've spoken about finishes um, in the past, but. Um, yeah, there was 60 bottles into the country, basically. Do you want to maybe just take us through a little bit about this whiskey? Because, um, you know, I've held a lot of bottles of whiskey in my hands in these large streams, and immediately I can tell this has got 50 mils more in it because it's slightly heavier than my arm was expecting it to be. Because uh, obviously we see 700 mils a lot in Australia. This is 750, so it is the American version. Um, I mean, where, where does this whiskey come from? And, and uh, you know, what was the, the beginning of it? Yeah, well, that's so, so it's... Um... I mean, it's such a small amount went, went to Australia, but part of that is, you know, a very small amount of this specific blend was actually only made. This is um, part of just two barrels of Pinot finish that I put together, this particular blend here. Um, these, are, these are barrels that uh, come from the same winery. So this is Suzor Wines here in Oregon. For those of you who don't know, uh, Portland, you know, where we make our whiskey is in the Willamette Valley. And just south of us, only a few kilometers away, we've got a ton of you know, world-class winemakers uh, doing a lot of Pinot Noir, a lot of Chardonnay, um, a lot of the Burgundy styles. And this, this particular winemaker uh, from Suzor is an old friend of ours. His name is Greg McClellan. Greg and his wife, Melissa, uh, have been making Suzor wines for about seven or eight years now. Um, but yeah, so, so Suzor is um, Greg's, Mother's family is French, spent a lot of time in France as a child. Um, so he is, yeah, strictly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. That's what he makes. Um, we've known him a long time. Our founder, Christian, used to actually manage um, a wine studio, the Carlton Winemaker Studio. And uh, Greg, Greg was part of that back in the day. It was this collective of a lot of these like renegade winemakers that were pooling their resources together, you know, and sharing equipment and sharing the costs of things and just kind of cutting their teeth, you know, early days. And so that's how we know Greg. But um, yeah, he, his, his winery, um, I hesitate to call it a winery. Um, it almost seems like too big of a term. He's got this, um, he's got a winery within a winery. So he actually manages um, the Meth Bend family vineyards. And then within that vineyard, uh, he makes Suzor wines. Very, very small. Very, I mean, I think he makes 600 cases of wine a year. You know, really just, just not too much. Um, but we love Greg and we love his wine. His, his whole philosophy, you know, is authenticity. He's very collaborative. Um, Well-made wines that, you know, are made um, by the folks who own the brand. So that's something that we just really identify with as far as you know, his ethos goes. And so this particular uh, Pinot finish that we have here uh, is just two barrels and both of those barrels came from Greg, from his Suzor Wines uh, Pinot Noir label. Yeah, and when, when you're talking about uh, obviously going for, for Pinot Noir, is that because of the, the fact that the region does Pinot and Chardonnay very well or did you have in your mind that you wanted to go out and find Pinot Noir or what brought you to that, to that discussion? I mean, our inspiration, um, yeah, is what we're all about here at Westwood. We say we are a whiskey of the elements. You know, we are a whiskey of the Northwest. We talk a lot about our provenance. Um, we use barley that's grown here in the Pacific Northwest. We age, you know, just a few kilometers away from where we distill. So yeah, Pinot Noir was the natural choice for us. You know, we, 
didn't think a sherry or a port finish would really ring true with, you know, what we're, what we're trying to accomplish here. And, you know, as I said earlier, we have all these amazing Pinot Noir makers right here, just so close to the distillery. So yeah, Pinot Noir was very much the natural choice. It was the way to go for sure. I want to get a couple of quick shout outs to, uh, to Vinod, who's listening in from Bangkok on the Facebook and Mark Westmoreland uh, from the Woodburn Distillery in Thursa. So I think that officially means we've hit every time zone in the world uh, right now with, <laughs> with this one. So it's, I don't know what day it is. I don't know what day it is anywhere else, but here we are. Uh, we're doing, but, um, but I, I want to take a, a quick early question from the crowd from uh, Whiskey in Isolation, uh, who's here in the Zoom chat. Um, that remembers he bought the uh, the Pinot Noir from the Whiskey Club that was done for Australia last year, uh, Bertie's thing, and Bertie yeah. came on the, on the forum here as part of one of our streams. I was blown away by that version and then went and picked up uh, this one off, off us, um, but has already drunk the Whiskey Club version, is trying to remember uh, what the differences were in terms of various things. Do you remember that, that version at all? And can you maybe give a little bit of insight into the differences? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, whiskey in isolation. Cheers to you, man. Um, for sure. Yeah, that's uh, I know trying to remember right the the tasting notes from memory. Um, yeah, so that that version that we had done before um, that was the first Pinot Noir Westward Pinot cask finish to ever leave Oregon. That went to Australia. So I guess this would make the the only the second time to your shores. But uh, that that version, yeah, is quite a bit different in that. Um, that was an entirely different winemaker um, whose barrels that I, I had used for that finish. That's something that's been really fascinating about this whole process of Pinot Noir finish with Westward is, you know, these different winemakers, um, you know, have very different styles and very different approaches to making wine. And so these barrels, these French oak barrels that I get from them, these barriques, um, they have a lot of different characteristics that they want to add to the whiskey. And so that's, Whiskey Club version um, from last year was from a, a different winemaker, Remy Wines. Um, she is more schooled in the Italian style of winemaking, but because she is in the Willamette Valley, she, she does mainly Pinot Noir. I mean, she for sure makes an amazing Nebbiolo, but um, yes, it's so, so very different approach to her winemaking. And that Pinot finish was exclusively from Remy Wine barrels. And so, um, what we have here uh, is from Greg's winery, from Suzor, and yeah, I think just a bit of a different touch, definitely more of that Burgundian style, you know, of approach. And I think this version really highlights a bit more of the herbaceous and sort of cut hay and grassy qualities of Westward, whereas I feel like the Remy version was more jammy and, and very like heavy, dark fruit forward. And so, yeah, just a different expression for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit in the same boat, having, having tried both, but don't actually have both in front of me right now. And like the one thing that, that sort of jumps out to me a little bit on uh, the, uh, the Suzor one is that integration of like, there's still lots of fruit there. There's, there's a, a different integration of the fruit, a lot more chocolatey, heavier sort of notes, which sort of jumped out to me. Having, I'm not familiar with those wineries, but as soon as you said Burgundian, as to, you know, opposed to the Italian, I was like, okay, yeah whether that's putting ideas in my head, I was like, yeah, I can totally get that sort of sort of element. But I mean, yeah. like, we, we, when you rock up to a, a winery, uh, for example, and they let this weird person in to go look through their barrel house and go pick some barrels to mature whiskey in, are you looking for specific things out of barrels in terms of when, when you look at this, are you nosing things? Are like, well, what sort of things are you picking? Or do you just say, give me your two best, whatever you need to get rid of? That's a great question. No, we're, we're definitely picky about the barrels that we want to get from these makers. It's funny, Greg and I actually the other day were talking about this release, this finish, and, you know, just kind of tasting on it, dissecting it, talking through it. And, um, you know, he was talking about how, you know, he gets his French oak, he gets his barriques in, uh, you know, they're new, and he, he ages his Pinot Noir for about five years. And he was saying, you know, Miles, before these barrels left my winery and got, you know, we drove them over to your place. He's like, I weighed them and, and they weighed four and a half more kilos than they did when they were new. That much wine had soaked into those staves. Um, you know, it's, it's a good amount. Yeah. And, you know, so that's, that's, that's something that we definitely consider when we're looking at the winemaker and what their process is, how long they're aging, how many uses this barrel has seen 
for sure. Um, in the past, you and I, you know, we've talked about my approach to finishes with Westward, and I certainly want to be careful in that, you know, I, I don't want it to really mask too much of the character of Westward. I, I want the, the true, you know, the true robust kind of bold, fruity nature of Westward to come through. Um, you know, not really flavored, but more just finished. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, it, I, you know, with, with Greg's style of wine, um, it just, it, it, it made sense. I thought Westward's robust notes could really stand up to that heavy wine influence in that barrel. And uh, so, yeah, it, again, kind of going back to the winemaker's style, um, I'm sure, you know, some people have tried our stout cast finish there as well. Um, that, you know, that's another, that's the only other finish that we do for Westward. And that one, you know, that's, that's, that's an entirely different situation because I feel like brewers, um, you know, they follow a style for beer. You know, they file, you know, they follow the rules in the style of making a stout in a particular kind of stout, you know, a Russian Imperial stout or an Irish stout, a chocolate stout. There are, you know, guidelines that you follow almost to a T. Brewers are very, very specific. Um, whereas winemakers are more, you know, they're sort of putting their trust in the process. They have a style, you know, um, and it's, a, it's, it's just a different composition. And so when we send all these barrels, all of our whiskey barrels out to these brewers for our stout finish, we don't really see much of a variation in, you know, flavor contribution to the whiskey itself. Whereas with these wine barrels, um, there's huge variation and it absolutely depends on the winemaker and their style. So it's been really fun to release these, you know, um, kind of one-off exclusive to just that winemaker's blends. It's, it's been pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, inter it's very, very interesting. And I get to James Finnegan as well. And, and Mark uh, from Wolfburn Commons, good friends to have knowing the provenance can, you know, depend on their process, uh, which I think is, is very true as well, but um, just a little bit of a sidetrack and we'll come back to this, but, you, you, you keep, like, you, you're talking about the word finished, and it says the word finished on the bottles, as I can sort of say here, I'm pretty sure. It, yeah, so it says the word finished appears on these bottles. But, I mean, in this case, it's about 19 months or, or something, which is a long check on, like, a long piece of the time that was the, the full maturation. So when you're talking about a, a, a finish, is it fair to say that in, in your mind and in, in the westward, westward sphere of things, it's a finished flavor rather than necessarily a time finish, which is perhaps more conducive to how the Scottish have described the finish as it was 10 years, we're gonna give it a quick finish. And it's, it's, a, it's a time constraint, whereas you're talking about a flavor finish. Is that a fair thing to say? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I think that that is our approach to it for sure. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Again, I, I, I think Westwood's just so characterful. It's so flavorful. It's really got a good you know, spice structure to it that, yeah, it's, it's more, more of a flavor addition, exactly. And it's also, you know, it's a whiskey that's, you know, designed to be young. We don't want Westward to get really too far into its age and lose a lot of its brightness. And so, yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely a fair thing to say. I think that's a pretty keen observation, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Well, I mean, because I think it's an important distinction to make because it's, it's one of those terms that gets bandied around and we see it in Australia, we see it in Scotland, obviously in America and all sorts of places. And, you know, Japan, um, the new stories are all about the, the finish, but it can mean a, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but just, just going back to, um, back to where we were talking about these barrels. So you, you, you've gone into a winery, for example, we'll put these um, breweries to the side for one sec, but you've gone into a winery, you've identified some casks in a process. Are you then thinking in the back of your head, okay, I know which strain of Westwood whiskey is going to go into that? Or do you find that your, your barrels um, are pretty consistent ac across the board? Or do you find variations in your, your you know, maturing whiskey that's not quite there yet to say, okay, well, this, this particular flavor profile is going to work with stout cask, or this is going to work with um, you know, wine cask. Are you thinking that way as well, the re reverse engineering? Well, I will tell you at first, you know, it was just purely experimental. You know, we had never done that before with our whiskey. So, um, ah, that's an interesting point. That's really cool. Um, Westward, and this is sort of a generalization, but as, as it matures in its, its, you know, virgin oak barrel, it tends to kind of 
uh, split into two paths. I, I find barrels that will either go more towards the sort of brown sugar, lush or caramelized um, milk chocolate style, or um, it'll get a bit more herbaceous and um, baking spice, uh, sort of grassy, more of a nuttiness. Um, and that's just kind of where, where barrels will tend to head one way or the other. And, you know, so I, I had an idea that, you know, I'd probably want to put the more herbaceous barrels into the, the Pinot casks. Um, whereas those kind of darker, roasty or chocolatey ones would do a bit better, you know, as a flavor match with the stout finish barrels. Um, but yeah, yeah, that wasn't like empirically derived or anything, you know, we had never done that before. Um, and so, yeah, it was, that was definitely experimental at first, but I've, I've found that to be true for sure. Um, and that's, that's the idea, you know, with these finishes, uh, I want them to highlight a lot of characteristics that are already in the whiskey itself. I don't want it to steer the whiskey into a different direction. It, you know, with the Pinot finish, I want those kind of lighter fruit notes and herbaceous notes, that nuttiness to really get turned up and, you know, accentuated by the Pinot Noir. Same with the stout finish, um, you know, to really just, again, highlight what's already there. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always experimenting. There's always, there's always more things to try. So um, something that I've actually been doing for the past year is, you know, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a subscriber to um, Elevage. I, I like to treat my single malts similar to how a lot of people age cognac and that barrel program and that style. And so I've actually been taking a lot of my westward at one year in its, or a little over one year in its virgin oak and actually taking it off new oak and putting it onto French, used French oak for the duration of its maturation. Yeah, which is, which, which is fascinating. And you know, I, I find that world quite interesting in terms of identifying those flavors within the first six months almost and go, okay, yep, this is going to be good as 10 years, but okay, this is going to be 30 or 40 years. Let's get it out. Let's settle it down and, and let it go. But you know, it's interesting what you're saying about those herbaceous and roasty notes, but they're like the DNA is still there because I definitely get still those chocolatey notes on on this pen and wire cask as, as well. Like it's still there, um, yes. but it's, yeah, I mean, and it sort of leads into a question from um, from whiskey in isolation um, that 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 multi finish that you get across across Westwood is sort of pointing out there um, is having that signature flavour important or is it more just about making the best whiskey? that it can be, regardless of whether it's might be slightly a weirder version of Westwood um, and not be as signature as some of the others? Uh, I'm going to say yes, <laughs> <laughs> because both. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, we are very particular about the grain that we get in for making Westwards. We probably just annoy the ever living hell out of our maltster just with how involved we want to be in that process. Um, you know, we're ex brewers, so we are very, very much just malt fanatics. Uh, and yeah, we want the grain to really shine through in, in the, you know, final spirit in the matured version of Westward. And so that's part of why it is meant to be, you know, on the younger side, as far as whiskeys go, but we also recognize and want Westward to be, very dynamic whiskey. You know, we don't have an age statement on our labels. We don't put batch numbers on our labels either. But yeah, I'm I'm absolutely up for a bit of variability. Um, I always want someone to recognize Westward when they pick up the bottle and pour it into a glass for sure. Um, but yeah, you know, whiskey is it's a living, breathing thing. It's always evolving. And so, yeah, we, we encourage a bit of variability for sure. But yeah, we're very particular about our grain. And we absolutely always want the grain to come through in that way. And part of us being so obnoxious about our, our malting process with, you know, the people who do it for us, which is uh, Great Western Malting. They're, they're just a few miles down the road. They've been around since the 1930s here. Um, supply a lot of the breweries here with, with their grain. Um, I think we're upwards of like 82 or 84 breweries now in the metro area of Portland. Um, so they're busy, but... Yeah, they, they get in, you know, all Pacific Northwest grown barley, um, but we actually have them modify it just a bit more. It's what they call their high color base malt. So it's actually kilned just a little longer and a bit of a higher temperature. 
And so you're getting a bit more of the caramelization. You're getting a little more of those Maillard reactions happening inside that kernel. And so, yeah, it's just going to mean more flavor. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I mean, I was like, these sort of conversations are, are, are music to my ears. I mean, been to a lot of whiskey tastings over the past decade or so, and it's only really been the last five years where the words like malt and yeast and that sort of thing have become to the fore of the, the presentation. It's always been age and, uh, you know, cast type and, and that sort of thing, particularly when, you know, we, with, 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 the, with the Scottish guys. So it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. But let's, um, let's, let's talk about uh, Suzor a little bit because it's not a winery I'm particularly familiar with. Um, as far as I know, we don't see a huge amount of Suzor in, in Australia. So you, you touched on them being, you know, quite, quite small and they're Burgundian sort of, sort of style and the way they, they do things. So obviously Pinot Noir, but like what, what else do they do as a, as a very classic Pinot Chardonnay sort of grapes? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's pretty classic when it comes to that. So yeah, again, Greg, you know, has a French mother who's actually very much involved in the wine scene here in Oregon as well. Um, she was actually very good friends with the Ponzi family um, who Greg actually worked for. The Ponzi family started uh, Bridgeport Brewing, which was the first brewery I ever worked for to give you an idea of just how small our scene here is. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah straight out of brewing school, I brewed for Bridgeport Brewing. They were opened in 1982. They actually closed last year, which was, was too bad. But um, yeah, they were making IPA in 1982 when, you know, in the States when people were still just drinking fizzy lager and, you know, didn't even know what that was. So a pretty classic uh, brewery, but that gives you also kind of a sense of history here in the States, especially along the West Coast where, you know, we had this wine renaissance throughout the 50s and 60s and 70s, and then they saw, you know, the importance of craft beer and how that was going to kind of be the next phase um, throughout the 80s into the 90s and early aughts. And, and now, you know, we're following suit as craft distillers, you know, especially as single malt makers on the West Coast, you know, and so it's kind of gone from wine to beer to now, you know, whiskey made from that, that same barley. So, um, but yeah, so, so Greg's family is very involved in, in Oregon wine. Um, like I said, his, his, you know, family's from France. He studied in France. Um, and yeah, if you're going to study in France to make wine, you're going to, you're going to do it by the book. You're going to be pretty much, um, that, that didn't mess around over there. No, no, they're a stickler for the rules for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, very, very traditional in that way. But, you know, again, he has this very, earthy craft approach of, I mean, you know, even Melissa who handles the, the marketing and the branding and the outreach, you know, she and I were also talking the other day when we were sipping on some of this and she was saying, you know, when we started the winery, the only demand I had was that, um, you know, no bottle would be over $40, you know, that it would be an incredible wine that is a state grown, you know, made by us, but that anyone can access. She's like, I wanted it to be whiskey. I'm sorry, I wanted it to be wine that I could afford. I heard a train. It wouldn't be wouldn't be a live stream without hearing the train. <laughs> are we yeah. three for three? No. Yeah, bloody oath we are. <laughs> that's, that's the only reason you're invited back is because I get to hear the train. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sorry, continue. Here it comes. Yeah. Have a whiskey break. Yeah, is is it like the drinking game? Every time the train the horn goes up. Oh boy. Yeah, oh, actually, my my guy's already been this to it in the Zoom chat. She was she was well ahead of that. <laughs> Um, sorry, continue. Okay, that's one word. Yeah. <laughs> Please drink responsibly, everyone at home. It's going incredibly slow. So that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, so we're, you know, our, our distillery is in the uh, industrial area of Portland, the east side industrial area. So we get some trains sometimes. I think especially late at night is when they send a lot through here. But uh, yeah. Well, anyway, so, so yeah, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, love to, you love to say it. He's, he's, he's obviously watching the stream, trying to get a mention. Right, yeah. yeah. He's got a few things to say. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, so we, we really identify with, with Greg and Melissa's approach to making Suzor. Um, like I said, they're, they're so tiny. I mean, max out at 600 cases a year. Um, they don't even have a tasting room at the winery. It's such a small space. He does pop-ups around town there. So, so when you get out of Portland and you get closer to wine country in the Willamette Valley, you're actually starting to get into the foothills of our coastal mountain range. There's a lot of farmland over there. And um, you, just, you just have these really small, really cool towns um, that maybe just have, you know, a couple restaurants and bars and mostly just farms and vineyards. And so Greg's gotten into the habit of, you know, he'll do pop-ups for tastings, you know, at um, the local dive bar or, you know, at like a farmer's market. Um, and, you know, that's, that's just how they do it. That's how they like it. They're, they're really, really dedicated to what they're doing at, at a very, very small level. Yeah, Cesar is very cool. And, and this is actually, so these are the, the two barrels that made up this blend um, are actually the last that I have from him. So I, I need to get some more barrels from that guy and uh, get back on some finishes. I've just been so wrapped up in, you know, it's fascinating again, how different characteristics we're getting from these different winemakers barrels. So I've been wanting to try, you know, these guys over here, or, you know, there's so many great winemakers I've been wanting to experiment with um, that, uh, yeah. I, I kind of got to come back around full circle and get some more from Greg. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, to put that into perspective, and I, I've had it reasonably confirmed in the chat here that we don't see Suzor in, in Australia, which it makes sense because, what, 600 cases a year, that's just over 7,000 bottles uh, a year, which is not not a lot, um, cases of 12. Um, and, and Mark comments on, on the Facebook, great to hear about the price in the wine. Is that reflected in, in Westwood? You know, it's all about being accessible for the consumer. And I think it is. You know, we're talking about, uh, that's probably a question that I can answer a little bit easier in terms of, you know, the Australian retail market. You know, we're talking about a premium American single malt at, you know, 45% across the range. And yet it, it is a premium product. So we were talking above 100, but between that sort of like 100 to, to 160 mark for the, the super premium, which is your, your Pinot and your Oregon sort of in the, the Oregon stout cusp in the middle. So yeah, it is, you know, what, what I would consider in 700 mil bottles, because um, we do get a few 500s over here as well. Um, I, I do think it is is accessible and, and sort of available, but um, I want to wheel back to something that you were talking about in terms of the development of you know the region that you live in and, and that you work in, and it's gone from you know wine to craft beer now to to spirits. Obviously, in Australia, we're a little bit you know normally about five years behind everyone. We've been quite quick with craft spirits, but certainly with wine and craft beer, we were a little bit behind everyone. So, a bit of an insight for us here: what's going on at the moment? that we can expect to see in Australia five years? Because obviously, whatever you guys are doing, we're going to copy. <laughs> Look, I, I, I think you're, you're well situated there. Honestly, you, yeah, the, man, when I, when I was there, um, I just was blown away by the, the distilling scene there. It's just absolutely incredible. I made my way down to, um, to Tasmania as well and got to see some pretty incredible operations down there also. Um, yeah, no, we've still got a lot of, uh, I don't know, hangovers from the, from the prohibition era here as far as, you know, legalities and, you know, we've got states, we've got our 50 states and each state has its own rules and regulations about what you can and you can't do. And it's just a, an absolute nightmare. So I think at this point, you guys are, are taking the lead for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as far as beer <laughs> goes here, I don't know if you want uh, a, a lot of what's going on here uh, as far as beer, maybe five years in the future. Um, things, are, things are getting pretty wacky. I think I saw someone put out a mustard beer. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, no, we, we, we're well up on you on that one already. We might have done the catch up. Okay. okay. We, we, we're just obviously coming out of winter, so we're seeing the last dregs of some very, very sweet, sugar-filled butterscotch mud cake surprise, pecan, peanut butter stuff. Um, I think we've, we've taken all of your ideas and instead of like doing them over five years, done them all in one year and generally in the same beer as well, which is, you know, it's mixed results, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, it makes me feel like a cranky old guy because I, I haven't been a brewer in almost 10 years and I'm just like, what is this? What, is this? what are these yeah. guys? <laughs> I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't. Why would I want to drink that? I, I like my beer to taste like beer. I don't know. I'm, I'm out of the game. I guess I don't get it. 
Yeah, well, mate, to, to give you an insight into the conversations between the whiskey department and the beer department here at the Oak Barrel, it's a very, very similar dynamic. And as I was saying before, when I did reach for an American beer to drink uh, tonight from California Mother Earth uh, Buku, which I haven't had before, that's very nice. It said India Pale Ale. It does say tangerine, citrus, and forest pine and that sort of thing, but I made sure it said India Pale Ale and uh, not too much more than that. I was like, I'm safe with this. I know what it's going to taste like. <laughs> you fucked up <out> there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, no, very good. But I mean, um, so one of the questions I was going to ask, but um, uh, Whiskey in Isolation is, is sort of preempted here as well. Um, obviously, we were talking off there before you guys have been pretty busy. You had to shut down for a little bit there. Um, you know, we know from Australia, keeping up with demand, keeping us stocked with, you know, various finishes and stuff is, is quite busy. Is there anything in the pipeline um, outside of, you know, that sort of used oak thing you, you were talking about? Um, and Will we see any potential Chardonnay cast finishes or double maturation? Because we're starting to see a few of Chardonnay casts in Australia as well, um, as, as recently as last week when we did a, a live stream. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so yes. There's uh, which, you know, now that I'm talking about needing to get more barrels from Suzor, I should get some of his Chardonnay barrels. Um, but yeah, I, I picked up a few Chardonnay barrels earlier this year from another great winemaker, Dominio Four. Um, pretty, pretty outstanding winemaker as well. Um, he does incredible Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs as well. Like I said, we're very heavy on that in the valley here. And so, yeah, picked up, I think, four of his Chardonnay barrels for a finish on Westwood that was, yeah, maybe January or February. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for that. I think that's going to complement Westward really, really well. Um, and yeah, I know for sure that uh, some, some wine from Dominio 4 <clears throat> that we love as a finish on Westward will be, uh, that'll make its way to Australia as well. Excellent. Sooner than yeah. later. Yeah, so I'd like, and I, I'm talking from absolute space of no data but just like wrecking my brain of some of the Aussie distilleries and certainly Scottish distilleries that have played with both red wine casks taking fortifieds out of it but like red wine casks and white wine casks often it just seems like distilleries their spirit leans to one or the other some go really well with you know the Chardonnay casks and that sort of and others go really well with either Shiraz or Pinot or something else like that what what is it about the Westwood spirit that gives you a little bit of faith that it's going to be able to work with you know what a, what a quite ends of the spectrum when it comes to wine. Well, I'd say it all comes down to balance. You know, when we created Westward, when we thought about, you know, what is it that, uh, you know, we could contribute to the world of single malt as, you know, American malt makers. Um, you know, we had a lot of ideas as ex-brewers, you know, we were very focused on the malt and the fermentation, right? You know, we use an ale yeast to ferment our, our beer wash. Um, it's actually a, a pretty, pretty well-known ale yeast here in the States. It's the Sierra Nevada pale ale yeast strain. It's really fruity and floral, great honey notes. Um, so we had a lot of ideas and knowing that traditionally American whiskey, you know, it goes into new oak. It goes, the new make just, it goes right into virgin oak, right? And so, you know, when you, when you think about the American drinking palate, it wants big, you know, it wants wood, it wants vanilla, it wants spice. Um, it just kind of, the American palate is, you know, it, it wants things amplified. And so therefore what, you know, what we export and what the rest of the world knows from the US as far as what we drink is it's just a bit bigger. It's just a little bit more. And so knowing that we want to do obviously stay within some of those parameters and people's expectations of what a whiskey from the States would be, our number one goal was to make a balanced whiskey, right? You know, with all of these really big, big characteristics, you know, kind of competing in the same room for, you know, the, 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 their chance to speak, we wanted to make sure that the whiskey was balanced. That to me is, is the ultimate goal for Westward. It is a big whiskey, it's got a lot going on, but it's, it is balanced. And that's, you know, when I'm tasting barrels, um, when I'm looking for maturity, you know, we, again, we don't put an age statement on it. It's ready when it's ready. It is aged to maturity. And 
to me, part of that is balance. It's not only what it's gained, but what it's lost. And so I think it's, I think it's a testament to, yeah, how balanced Westward is and that we can age it in a, you know, a Pinot Noir barrel, but also age it in a Chardonnay barrel. And then it's going to interact with those elements in a way that, that will eventually integrate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that's, that's such an interesting uh, sort of concept to watch from a, a drinker's and a consumer's point of view is to see how not only whiskeys develop in terms of production, but how the people behind the whiskey develop in terms of what they're looking for and, and how, you know, your palate develops and how, you know, because we've seen Westwood, we've seen Westwood in, in this bottle, we've seen it in the, in the previous bottle shape. Um, and now in Australia, at least, we've seen two versions of the, of the Pinot Noir. And um, maybe we should sort of wheel back to where we started tonight. I'm, I'm wary that we can't keep you forever because like, I'm going to stay drinking, you know, all night long, but uh, it's it's midnight or 1am nearly where, where you are. But let's 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 roll back to this, exactly to that whiskey we're talking about. Let's, let's take it like a, a look at this whiskey. Let's write some, like some impressions about it down because, you know, just based off what Whiskey in Isolation was saying, I don't want to get here in six months' time when something else lands and be like, gee, I wish I could remember what, what that is. I mean, I've only got about, you know, three or four left to sell. I saw, we just sold another one online there. So I'm going to, I don't need to sell anymore, but just for like on record so we can get this written down and on, on record yes. so we can come back to it. So, I mean, what I was sort of saying, where we sort of come to the, like the fruits there, but it's really well integrated with, with the spirit. I feel like it's quite a weighty version of the, of the pen and white cast. It's quite muscular. But, and particularly on the nose, that that chocolatey element that sort of follows through um, a little bit, and you know, the the malt really comes back on the finish. It's not as prominent on on the nose for me. But I mean, how do how do you? You've obviously sat with this whiskey a little bit longer than I have. Like, how, what's your impressions of it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the I mean, I the, at at its core, there's always going to be a bit of chocolate in Westward for sure. Yeah, and I think I think that's in, that's indicative of the the malt itself. Yeah, grown here in the Pacific Northwest, um, kilned a little, you know, higher. It's modified a bit more. That's always going to be there for sure. Um, but yeah, you know, dark fruits, um, kind of like plum. Um, what I was really looking for, um, and I was hoping would come together, was um, a bit of like tobacco, like pipe tobacco. Um, I get that in the finish of Westward. There's some nice phenolics. Um, that I get a bit of, I can suss out some pipe tobacco in some blends. Um, and then also, you know, drinking on some Pinot Noir, I can also get that uh, in the nose as well. And so I, I really wanted those to come together and feature. And I, I think that's a nice aspect of it as well. A bit of, yeah, that kind of pipe tobacco, which I think develops not only from, you know, sort of the <clears throat> tobacco that you could get from Pinot Noir, but also um, a bit of those phenolics that you get from the, from the malt, from the whiskey itself. And then of course, you know, you're going to get some vanilla from the new oak that we, you know, age this whiskey in before it's transferred to its second cask. And so to me, yeah, that's just, that just screams pipe tobacco for sure. Um, but yeah, a lot of that nice dark fruits, um, you know, kind of dried fruit, like raisin plum for sure. Um, but you know, it's still got that, that stone fruit as well. Um. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And what, one thing I, I I don't get from it, which I think you know that what we we're talking about before that sort of concept of the um, the word finish and what that means to different people in different situations. The one thing I don't get when immediately I see the word finish, I subconsciously go looking for is oak, and there's not a huge amount of obvious oak on this. Which now that I think about it, was true of the Oregon Stout cast as well. Um, which I guess is that element of the um, that integration of, of things there. Um, Whiskey in isolation says 100% gets the uh, the char on the nose, um, uh, but he's sitting in a, a wingback leather chair, so maybe it's coming from the chair, maybe it's coming from the uh, the whiskey. But you know, that's a nice compliment. Experiences are experiences, so it doesn't matter where you you uh, you do it. Whiskeys always taste smokier in front of the fire. That's that's a true fact. Um, but yeah, I think it's. Um, like it, it's a it's a, it's a great whiskey and as as I said like this is a to anyone watching this is a very soft sell if you don't already have this whiskey because I've only got a handful left there is a bottle store in Melbourne uh, who unfortunately name I have I just eluded me that um, I don't know if they've got any left but um, feel feel free to uh, go throw some money to our friends in Melbourne in in all aspects of it, all industries um, if if you uh, can't get it off us but um, yeah I mean this 
there were 60 bottles that came into Australia. Um, do, you, do you know how many there were all up um, from, from two, two casts? There can't have been too many. All together? Oh, yeah, no. Um, I'd say maybe, God, what did we get? Probably about 600? Yeah. Yeah. So, minuscule. Yeah. Yeah, minuscule. That's, that's the whole bottling. Yeah. yeah. And, and like in terms of when, when you release this locally, is this through like a, a mailing list or a cellar door or like how, how would this bottle have, have appeared in America? So, so yeah, this, this is released through, <clears throat> through our tasting room and through our whiskey club. Um, yeah, this does not, I mean, aside from the 10 cases that came that way, uh, this, this doesn't leave the state of Oregon. Um, are, we, are, we, are we allowed to say at all that some did escape and come to Australia or is, do we, is it a little bit <laughs> under wraps? No, I think that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, they can, I just can't ship it back to them, but they can come and buy it off me if they want. <laughs> just drink it quickly before they ask for it back. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, so it's, it's released you know, through the distillery. I'm actually in our tasting room right now on the other side from our stills. Um, but you know, something else that's really great that we get to do here is you know Westward has we have our own whiskey club. Um, it's it's Oregon only because we can't ship to other states, but it gives us the chance to take a lot of these either early experiments or one-offs that um, we just you know had to try, and it's it's a it's an avenue for which to release those. You know, people who join our club are obviously you know whiskey aficionados and people who really appreciate you know crafts single malt and. Yeah, so this this is released mostly through our club. We we have um, quarterly releases through our club, and this could be anything from um, we just actually the last release was a sourdough single malt. Um, which yeah, I don't know if you. <laughs> we I think we were talking about it last time. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I'd mentioned it before. This is we have this very famous baker here in in the city of Portland, Ken Forkish. Um, writes these like award-winning baking books, but he's got this, yeah, like 300 year old French Levin, you know, sourdough starter that um, he brought to the distillery and we use that in place of our ale yeast to ferment out our wash. Uh, it was a two week fermentation and yeah, made some pretty outstanding single malt. But, you know, as far as, you know, commercially viable, maybe not. Um, it is absolutely <laughs> delicious. Um, I mean, even economically viable, you know, it tied up our fermentation tanks for over two weeks. So it was kind of a nightmare, but it made sensational whiskey. You know, it's got this really great big like peach note to it, really phenomenal whiskey. Um, so yeah, it's, it's through our whiskey club that we're able to release these things, these one-offs. Um, you know, we also experimented with, um, you know, switching up our grain bill just a little bit here and there. Um, actually, um, I think, I think we might actually be sending some down that way. Um, it's what we call our two malts. So we're actually adding another malted grain to our mash bill in a small amount. Um, the first one we released to the club was two malts rye. So it was 90% our malted barley, our, our base malt and 10% malted rye in the mash. We aged that for about four years and released that to the club last year. Um, our next release is going to be the two malts wheated and that's 70% uh, base malt, all malted barley, and then 30% malted wheat. Yeah, okay. I can, I can see how that would work. It's delicious. Yeah. It's, a, it's absolutely delicious. I've, I've been marrying four casks for the past year. And um, yeah, I think, we're gonna, I think we're gonna send some down your way. But yeah, I, th I think, um, yeah, uh, Marga, who looks after Westwood uh, in Australia, for those who aren't familiar, He's getting a couple of emails from me um, after this, and I've just actually seen um, another bottle of um, uh, Westwood uh, Pin and Wildcast come through. I can't, I only get the alerts of what's been sold, so I don't know who ordered it, but uh, I thank you. I'm sure you're probably listening. Um, so uh, yeah, it's 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 cool. And um, oh uh, yeah, I, I, there's, I'm getting some messages here. I don't know if I can say them out loud on the stream, but uh, basically, Westwood fans watch this space in terms of what's what's coming here. Um, a big g'day to uh, Jacob on the uh, on the Facebook chat as well there. Um, but I mean, I, I was going to ask this right at the end, and we are getting to that point now of like, what can we expect and what's what's new and, you know, not necessarily what we committed to in Australia, but like what's going over there so I can go and harass people so we can try and make it come over here. 
but you've sort of answered that already in terms of yeah. lots, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're always we're always experimenting. That's that's you know that's that's the beauty of it. Really, we we are. I mean, I say this all the time, and so apologies for the broken record, but you know, whiskey is grain, water, yeast, wood, and time. Right? It's just those five elements. But you know, changing out one of those, or even just one portion of one of those yields entirely different results. And I, you know, we're, we're big believers in, um, you know, flavor expression and knowing that, um, I mean, this is why, we, this is why we, you know, our first export market is Australia. I feel like people there, you get it. You understand that there's just so much more that can be had in the world of whiskey and that, you know, new world whiskeys, especially single malts, there's, there's so much that can be had in, in new flavors and new expressions um, that, you know, we're, we're just scratching the surface. So, you know, something as simple as, yeah, swapping out our ale yeast for a sourdough Levan, you know, otherwise the same, right? Just double pot distilled the same way, aged in our virgin, you know, kiln dried charred oak. Um, that's just one little element that makes this incredibly different vivacious whiskey, so. Yeah, we're always we're always trying new things. Yeah, uh, that's 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 why we love you. We, we get we get bored otherwise. We uh, just like you. We don't like to sit still. It always needs to be something new and new, exciting. Absolutely. Um, and you know, yeah. whiskey's whiskey's so evocative, right? And it's, it can be really inspiring. And so you know, if you really are truly involved in you know w the whiskey process and drinking and appreciating whiskey, I mean, I don't think you can help but wonder what else you could do. Yeah, it's uh, we we actually do this thing um, with with a few friends with with Alex and Matt Bally from the Society and um, Milne called Roundtable uh, Whiskey Roundtable on Wednesday night to do this little bit of a chat. And you just reminded me then of uh, what we call in house torture, where we ask each other impossible questions to answer. Um, so I'm actually going to steal it, and I do apologise for the other three for stealing that content and bring it over here. But I want to ask you, I want to ask you like a would you rather question based on what you were just saying there. Uh, and it's a bit of a curveball and people go either way. Would you rather never drink the same whiskey twice? So be forced to always drink something new or only drink what you've already drunk previously. So there's, there's sort of two aspects to it. Obviously, we all have that scratch, that itch to scratch of I want to try the new thing, the new thing, the new thing. But there is that time, say, you know, 1 a.m. on Tuesday morning where you just want a whiskey that you know is going to be just to exactly hit the spot on the couch or whatever it is. So never drink the same whiskey twice ever again or only drink what you've drunk in the past. Oh, that's a, that's a very cruel hypothetical. I know wow. it sucks, doesn't it? It's really <laughs> shit ass. That's terrible. Um, wow. Well, I, I, I guess I have to say because of uh, perhaps my, my love and my profession, um, I've had a lot of whiskeys, so I guess I, I'd stick with what I've already had. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I, it's, I, I return your curveball with a curveball. I'm this experimental distiller, but uh, yeah, I'll yeah. stick with what I know, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, as, as an Atlanta Braves fan, I'm a little bit allergic to uh, curveballs after uh, this weekend, so we'll, we'll move on from that one. Uh, <laughs> Um, but look, it, it's getting a little bit silly now. So I, I do want to say a, a huge thank you, uh, Miles. We, I think we said about 45 minutes and I've kept you much longer than that. So I, I really appreciate you, uh, first of all, staying up um, till all hours of the night to, to come and talk to us Australians, uh, but also for all your passion and your um, restlessness and your ingenuity in what you're creating in, in whiskey um, and, and pushing forward and the fact that you identify that, that we like it over here and and then hopefully it can, it can keep coming here. So a big, uh, a big thank you to you. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we can't wait to see what's coming next. Uh, thank you, Scott. And it, honestly, the pleasure is all mine. You, it's, you know, my third time hanging out with you and it's, it's always fantastic. It's always engaging. And yeah, thank you for being such a fan and an appreciator. And um, yeah, thank you for all you do. I'm, I'm happy to stay up late and drink whiskey <laughs> with you guys. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I tell my mom, it's still a job. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, my, uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in on the, on, on the Facebook across the, the various places. And, and thank you for your questions and comments there. Um, we will be back at, at some point and watch this space. There's a couple of bottles left here. If, when we sell out, um, if the Melbourne retail has any, I'll, I, I do apologize. I'll, I'll remember their name and can flick you on their details. Um, but until we, we speak again, I will, I will speak to you uh, soon. But uh, 
Thank you, social media and all the internet bots we pay to bump up our numbers.